So hi everyone and welcome to the FuseNet's briefing on food security outlook for Sudan and South Sudan for the period of June 2023 to January 2024. My name is Emily Toronto and I'm a senior food security analyst based in FuseNet's Washington DC office. So in today's briefing, um, I'll start with a review. Um, uh, sorry, I'll start with a review of the approach to our early warning analysis and the integrated phase classification or IPC 3.1 food security scale for classifying outcomes. I'll then present the seasonal calendar for the region in order to provide context for our analysis, followed by a summary of the key messages from our June outlook. For the current situation, I'll actually be um, taking the opportunity to present data that was available into July, noting that it did not affect our um, classifications for our mapping classifications for July. I'll then proceed with assumptions that lead into our projected outcomes through January 2024 and conclude with some slides on area of areas of concern for um, each country. So as we usually do in our outlook briefings, I'll quickly start with a review of the eight step scenario development methodology used for FuseNet's early warning analysis. Step one is grounded in our knowledge of local livelihoods and how poor households typically access food and income at different times of the year. We then collect and analyze available primary and secondary data on key drivers of food insecurity in order to describe and classify current food security outcomes as identified in step two. In step three, we develop evidence-based assumptions for the projection period that, are, that guides our analysis in steps four and five. Um, Based on the analysis, we then classify the most likely household and area level food security outcomes in the projected period using the IPC 3.1 phase classification scale that I'll describe on the next slide. Finally, in step eight, we identify events that the most likely scenario. So on this slide, we'll provide an overview of the IPC 3.1 phase classification scale for acute food insecurity. There are five phases to classify the household going from minimum phase one up to catastrophe phase five as shown in the top row as we go from household level classification to area level classification at least 20 percent of a given area's population must meet the criteria for a given phase in order for area to be classified in that phase so there are likely households experiencing different phases within that same area so for example if we look at the area classification for crisis in the middle of the second row we can see that many households are actually experiencing little to no food insecurity, but more than 20% of them are in phase three or worse, resulting in the final classification of phase three at area level. For phase three and higher, humanitarian food assistance is urgently needed to protect livelihoods and fill food consumption gaps. On our map, FuseNet uses the exclamation point to indicate when the classification of an area would be one phase worse in the absence of current or programmed humanitarian assistance. For this outlook period, we assessed food security outcomes in the current period, June, and projected outcomes for the near term, July to September, followed by the medium term, October through January. The first period covers the main rainy season for unimodal South Sudan and Sudan, which typically spans June through September and brings with it seasonal flooding in the floodplains of the Sud wetlands, as well as in the river basins across both countries. We also have the second rainy season in bimodal South Sudan, spanning June through November. Agricultural and agropastoral households are engaged in crop cultivation and typically face depletion of household stocks from the last agricultural season and increased reliance on wild foods and markets for food access. However, market stocks seasonally decline during this time and prices typically peak, which when combined with low income opportunities translates to generally quite poor purchasing power for agricultural households. While ag labor demand does pick up with the start of cultivation, rate, wage rates tend not to keep pace with rising food prices. In bimodal South Sudan, the first season harvest from the March to May rains becomes available between June and August, while for unimodal South Sudan, um, uh, not until the early green harvest typically becomes available uh, in September. For herders, this period is marked by the return migration to areas of origin and increased conflict between agricultural and pastoral groups, or often between diff different pastoral or agro-pastoral agro groups. The increase in pasture and water resources typically results in improved body condition and improved milk availability, as well as improved income from animal sales. So turning to the projection period out to January 2024, 
Both countries enter the main harvest period as the rains conclude over unimodal South Sudan and Sudan. This period is typically marked by improvement in outcomes as households replenish their own stocks and market prices decline. Food wa uh, flood waters typically start to recede and there's peak fishing opportunities in South Sudan. In Sudan, cultivation typically begins for irrigated winter wheat in November. Towards the end of the projection period, the pastoral lean season typically begins as pastures recede and surface water dries up and the dry season migration begins. So with that context, I'll um, turn to the key messages for the region. Overall, widespread crisis IPC phase three and emergency IP fa IPC phase four outcomes are expected in Sudan and South Sudan, dri driven by to varying extents by protracted and recent impacts of conflict, weather, escalating food prices and poor macroeconomic conditions. In Sudan, conflict has rapidly deteriorated food security conditions in major, major urban centers in Khartoum, Central Darfur, Greater Darfur, and Greater Kordofan. At the peak of the lean season, 25% of the population is expected to face crisis, IPC phase three or worse outcomes. Areas of highest concern include El Janina and surrounding towns in West Darfur, where ethnically based violence is restricting household mobility and capacity to access food and income. Some households will likely be in catastrophe in IPC phase five. In South Sudan, over 60% of the population is expected to face crisis, IPC phase three or worse outcomes at the peak of the lean season. Areas of highest concern and in emergency IPC phase four include Warap, Lakes, Northern Bargazal, and parts of Upper Nile, Jongle, and Eastern Equatoria. Some households in these areas will likely face catastrophe, IPC phase five, especially in Fashoda and Panyakan of Upper Nile State, where protracted impacts of conflict and flooding have severely undermined the livelihoods and access to food and income sources. The upcoming harvest is expected to improve food security outcomes marginally between October and January, particularly in more productive areas of Southeast Sudan and Western Equatoria and South Sudan. However, crisis IPC phase three will remain widespread and emergency IPC phase four will likely persist in parts of West and Central Darfur in Sudan in northern border counties in South Sudan, as well as in the border region between Upper Nile State and Jongle in South Sudan. While not the most likely outcome, FUSENET assesses there is a risk of famine in South Sudan, particularly in the Upper Nile Jongle border area. While recent trends and forecasts suggest the likelihood of escalating conflict or catastrophic, catastrophic flooding is declining, these areas have very high levels of acute food insecurity and malnutrition and a resurgence of conflict and or flooding still poses a risk to isolating households from already scarce sources of food. Turning to the current situation, uh, I'll start with a uh, recap of some key political uh, or strategic developments. As we're all well aware, there is yet to be a successful ceasefire or breakthrough in peace efforts. Ceasefires through April, May and June have all been violated and intense fighting has resumed immediately after each has lapsed. In mid-July, multiple efforts were initiated by regional actors, including a meeting of the IGAD Quartet Group on July 10th in Addis Ababa, chaired by Kenya's president. The Quartet of countries includes Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Sudan, but the government of Sudan boycotted the meeting, accusing Kenya of bias while RSF sent a representative. And representatives of EU, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, USA, and UK were also present. The summit proposed potential deployment of the East Africa standby forces, um, which was rejected by the Sudanese government. Subsequently, this was followed by a meeting of Sudan's seven neighbors in Cairo on July 13th, initiated by Egypt. It outlined similar goals as the Jeddah Declaration, which included the establishment of a lasting ceasefire, creation of safe humanitarian corridors for aid delivery, and support for a building a dialogue between the two fighting parties. Uh, a proposal that was supported by all seven countries as well as both Sudanese uh, parties. However, this was then quickly followed by a resumption of Jeddah talks on July 15th, but none of these efforts have subsequently have worked or and have all subsequently stalled and failed to stop the conflict. Meanwhile, local peace initiatives uh, and agreements that initially pri provided some hope in Darfur have also not been able to stem the spread of violence across that region. In West Darfur, extremely violent episodes have occurred repeatedly since the start of the conflict, and even some before, 
with particularly severe violence and mass killing in mid-June following the assassination of the governor on June 14th. Mass graves have subsequently been discovered and investigation ongoing into the extent and scale of deaths. Across the country, there continues to be signs of increased polarization. Since late June and early July, leaders of some communities have increasingly made public declarations of support for different sides, with many leaders in Darfur declaring support for RSF. While it's not marked on this slide, we did see in early, Sudan, uh, in early August, the Sudan Liberation Movement in central Darfur reportedly declared support for SAF. In the East, SAF has called for mobilization of volunteers and there are reportedly training camps established, although numbers of volunteers is unclear. Several community leaders in the East have also announced support for SAF. Meanwhile, in South Kordofan, parts of West Kordofan and Blue Nile, SBLM North, led by Al Hilo, has continued to carve out its own territorial control in the area. Overall, the conflict in Sudan has remained largely focused on strategic control over urban centers and trade routes. On this slide, we have a map on the left that shows hotspots of violent events that takes into account both number of events and number of fatalities between April and the end of July. And on the left, we have a weekly perspective of violent events since the beginning of the year. As you can see, most of the clashes in Sudan have been in Khartoum since the start of the conflict in mid-April, accounting for approximately 60% of all violent events. However, violence has also expanded in Darfur, starting in El Janina and spreading into central, south, and north Darfur, as well as into additional localities in west Darfur. El Obeid in north Kordofan has remained a very contested area, given centrality in connecting east to west. And as mentioned on the previous slide, conflict in south Kordofan and parts of west Kordofan and in Blue Nile has been driven by SPLM North Al Hilo efforts to expand territorial control within that area, clashing with SAF forces in Kadugli and Blue Nile. While this explosion of uh, conflict has occurred in Sudan, South Sudan has continued to see relatively low levels of violence in recent months, as you can see in the graph on the bottom uh, in shades of green. Of note is the continued low number of events recorded for UNS, uh, for Upper Nile State and Jongle, the darkest green area on the bottom of the area chart um, that has continued in the last weeks and months. Although there have been some sporadic clashes, mostly associated with tensions over scarce resources, such as the incidences reported in Malakal protection of civilian site in June and July. So I was noting um, where El Obeid is in the uh, country, and this is that connection between East and West. The conflict continues to drive considerable displacement with nearly 1 million or more displaced each month, according to available data from IOM. By the end of May, about 1.2 million were internally displaced, which rose to 2.2 million by the end of June and to over 3 million at the end of July. About 70% of internally displaced persons originate from Khartoum and have mostly been displaced into Western, yeah, sorry, into Eastern states. And about 70% of all displaced are living in host communities, which adds considerable strain on household and community resources. Displacement has also increased across parts of Greater Darfur, although it is likely to include a lot of redisplacement of households given this area is host to most of the protracted IDPs that were present prior to this current conflict, estimated at about 80% of the 3.7 million IDPs accounted for at the end of um, 2022. This challenge of understanding redisplacement and point of origin dynamics is, a, is in fact a key weakness to bear in mind when analyzing displacement data as well as the broader challenge of um, risk of underestimation in a context like Sudan, where many households have moved to live with family and their movements are not captured by displacement reporting mechanisms. Cross-border flows of refugees and returnees are also considerable, estimated at more than 900,000 by the end of July. Chad and Sudan have seen the most steady increases. Chad increased from about 180,000 at the end of June to 330,000 at the end of July. And South Sudan increased from about 140,000 at the end of June to over 200,000 by the end of July. In South Sudan, most of the newly arrived are South Sudanese returnees and have come through the rank border crossing, which is the darkest blue on the map. But also thousands are arriving in the northern bordering counties as indicated on the map. It is expected that many have migrated onwards, but detailed data is unavailable to do document where they've gone and their current location of displacement within the country. That being said, available data and key informant reports do suggest that substantial populations remain in these bordering countries and are adding considerable strain on available humanitarian and local resources in already very, 
uh, quite tense environments. Turning to the economic conditions, the conflict has significantly disrupted trade in Sudan, as can be seen in the map on the right, heavy fighting in Khartoum and along um, trade routes into and out of the city has greatly reduced trade flow into the city, which is not only a major destination for goods given the size of the population, but also a major collection and distribution hub for the entire country. In addition, the conflict and insecurity routes uh, into El Obeid, which is in the center, has greatly reduced flow of goods from east to west. In addition, conflict and insecurity across Greater Darfur has greatly reduced trade across the region. Elsewhere in the east, insecurity and rising transportation costs have also impacted flows, but not as severely. The impact of this disruption on trade of trade on staple food prices has been divergent. If we look at the example of sorghum, as shown on the graph on the right, prices to atypically declined between March and June in many Eastern markets as stocks atypically increased due to the inability of food to move easily from other markets, particularly Khartoum, but also westward, as, uh, as well as the release of stocks early from, earlier than usual due to mounting pressure on many households to support those who've been displaced and rising costs of living. But as you move west across the country, prices were rising faster as stocks decline and typical flows have been cut off. And of course, Khartoum, where trade flows and markets have been most severely disrupted, prices have seen the largest increases between March and June. And June. And of course, it's important to remember that these price increases are on top of um, years of steeply escalating prices for staple foods in the country. Looking at terms of trade as a proxy for household purchasing power, labor-dependent households in the Al Gadaref and Kasala areas uh, in the eastern part of the country shown here as the orange lines, have continued to experience relative stability given um, stability in sorghum prices and in wage rates. This is in contrast to typical patterns when, um, when improvements in labor wages for the start of the cultivation season are nonetheless outpaced by rising prices for staple foods, leading to a deterioration in purchasing power as can be seen in 2021 and 2022. The goat to sorghum um, trade, in terms of trade monitored in the El Obeid market and shown in green on the chart has declined steeply since March by about 30 percentage points due to a sharp increase, in, uh, sorry, a sharp decline in goat prices of about 24%. This decline in goat prices was due to increasing market supply as households sought to sell more animals due to insecurity and rising risks of animal looting, as well as to deal with rising costs of food and non-food essentials. While it's important to know on agro-pastoral households, they benefit from improvements in terms of trade in the last quarter of 2022 and through the first quarter of 2023. The rapid decline in uh, since the conflict began and likelihood of the trend continuing is negatively affecting the purchasing power of poor pastoral and agro-pastoral herders in recent months. Looking at South Sudan, uh, market functionality, as shown on the map on the left, uh, market functionality has remained limited in much of the center of the country and along the Nile River due to conflict and residual floodwaters. In the southern and western areas, routes um, that's there. In the southern and western areas, routes and markets are uh, generally better functionality at this time, reflecting cal generally calm conditions, apart from sporadic banditry and road ambushes, as well as the presence of armed cattle herders that are causing some periodic disruptions to movement of trade. Staple food prices that were initially declining from March to April due to, in part, to increased volume of cross-border trade from Sudan prior to the outbreak of conflict have subsequently increased um, sharply and atypically early between April and June, reflecting the precipitous decline in cross-border trade with Sudan and the tightening of East African regional cereal stock availability. For context, typical cross-border trade with Sudan is quite variable month to month, but follows a general pattern of increasing trade after, after the harvest and through the dry season, which is then typically followed by a decline in trade volumes going into the rainy season due to seasonal deterioration of feeder roads, as well as generally reduced cereal stocks in both countries before the arrival of the next harvest. Looking now at the goat to sorghum terms of trade measured in Juba market, we see generally continuous deterioration over the years, given that livestock prices have not kept pace with steep increases in food prices and households can afford less sorghum with the income earned from the sale of a medium goat. 
In June, the terms of trade declined again, um, driven by the sharp increase in the price of sorghum. Overall, the result is steadily worsening pastoral and agro-pastoral uh, purchasing power. Turning to seasonal progress, the onset of the rains was mixed, as you can see on the map on the left. A large segment of southern Sudan and northern S South Sudan experienced delayed onset of up to 10 days, as well as in central South Sudan. Pockets of even longer delays were observed in Upper Nile State and Eastern Equatoria in South Sudan. Over the rest of both countries, rains arrived 10 to 20 days earlier, early with some areas even earlier. Rainfall, uh, cumulative rainfall in uh, June and July was quite good over Sudan with pockets of below average in the Southeast. In South Sudan, the cumulative rainfall has been below average, particularly in Southeast and in parts of the Northwest. These trends have been broadly reflected in NDVI, which is a measure of vegetative health, although with more strongly pronounced deficits than one might expect developing in Southeast Sudan, likely due to a combination of high temperatures and delayed and below average cultivation due to the conflict. Um, however, I would note here that in areas of South Sudan, because uh, this is measuring uh, percent change and NDVI absolute values at this time of year are typically quite low as crops are just beginning to emerge. The variation can be very pronounced uh, from, from these low value, values, thus showing it as a large percent um, difference from normal. It's also important to note that NDVI captures any vegetative greenness and cannot differentiate between um, crop and non-crop growth thus capturing growth in, likely capturing some growth of um, grasses and other um, plants in fallow fields. And this is important to keep in mind when interpreting conditions across heavily conflict affected parts of greater Darfur where we anticipate planting to be below average. In South Sudan, the below average rainfall over Eastern areas is manifesting in below normal NDVI, particularly in Southeast pastoral and agro-pastoral areas, as well as over Central Nile Basin. While uh, in terms of flooding, while river levels and flood extents are measuring at similar levels to uh, recent past flood years in the Sud wetlands areas, flood extents have declined in western areas of northern Bargazal, while the above average rainfall in western Ethiopia has contributed to some rising flood waters in Sobat and Akobo basins in the northeastern parts of South Sudan, although it's not likely, it's not exceeding typical flood extents. Across most of the western half of the country, NDVI conditions are generally average. HFA, or humanitarian food assistance, has been extremely challenging in Sudan, given the insecurity, extensive loss of humanitarian assets, and lack of commitment by warring factions to honor humanitarian corridors for delivery. In June, food assistance was delivered to up to 1 million people with 50% rations. This included 300,000 in Khartoum, 200,000 in Eastern states, and uh, nearly 600,000 in Greater Darfur. West Darfur has remained largely inaccessible through the end of July, although it has been reported that in early August, the first delivery of food assistance arrived in West Darfur from Chad, estimated to be 125 metric tons transported on five trucks and distributed to uh, 50, over 15,000 people in three villages. According to the disaggregated distribution data shared with partners at the IPC analysis workshop in July, WFP plans to reach 2.5 million on average uh, during the lean season months and scale up to at least um, 4 million on average during the October to December period. However, it is likely that these plans will be revisited frequently as conflict dynamics evolve. If the 2.5 million on average monthly are reached at the peak of the lean season, this would reflect about 20% 20, 20 of Fusenet's estimated population in need. However, access will continue to be severely limited by insecurity, bureaucratic challenges, lack of restraint by armed groups, continued looting, and risk of diversion by armed groups, and likely further exacerbated by seasonal barriers to delivery, making the target difficult to reach. In South Sudan, the relative calm facilitated considerable prepositioning of lean season requirements, with WFP reporting nearly all of its planned prepositioning accomplished. WFP aims to reach 2.9 million people monthly through the lean season, adjusted to include the addition of South Sudanese returnees from Sudan. However, given that the assistance has typically only reached an estimated 20 to 30 percent of FUSENET's estimated population in need, and WFP is likely to continue to face funding and access constraints due to the rainy season conditions, banditry, and potential conflict, the target will also be difficult or challenging to reach. <laughs> 
I'd also like to note the addition of the gradient shading between the population reach uh, indicated by the green portion of the stacked bar and the estimate of remaining population in need indicated by the gray bar intended to reflect the inherent uncertainty in establishing if those determined to be most in need were actually those who were reached with assistance. So it's essentially acknowledging the challenges of targeting in the field. So turning now to the key assumptions through January, I'll start with the conflict assumptions. In Sudan, hostilities between RSF and SAF are expected to persist through the outlook period with emphasis on control over transit routes and urban centers. The intensity of fighting is expected to reduce in Khartoum towards the end of the year with RSF likely to gain the upper hand in the city. The reduction in conflict is expected in large part due to combatant fatigue, depletion of usable military hardware, and generally fewer strategic sites to fight over or looting to be done. On the other hand, tribal and ethnic tensions are expected to continue to escalate in Greater Darfur and Greater Kordofan with ethnic militias and other groups taking advantage of the increasing security vacuum. SBLM North in particular is likely to push to consolidate control over South Kordofan and Eastern parts of West Kordofan, although unlikely to extend beyond their traditional stronghold. Transit routes, small population centers, remote mining locations, and domestic oil infrastructure is likely to become increasingly insecure. In terms of oil infrastructure, it's increasingly unlikely that the South Sudan Sudan pipeline will be affected. But on the other hand, domestic flow of refined oil is likely to be compromised, a trend that's already been observed since RSF captured the refinery in Khartoum in May and volumes coming out of the refinery have been observed to be declining. This is likely to continue to contribute to rising transportation costs as the cost of fuel on the black market increases. The RSF's capture of remaining critical objectives in Khartoum, namely al Shajara Armored Corps Base, a vital SAF stronghold protecting the southern flank of the Army headquarters in central Khartoum, as well as the Army headquarters, headquarters itself, is likely to strengthen its position during negotiations and increase both SAF's willingness to negotiate before losing more ground and the RSF's desire to lock in its gains, increasing the likelihood for serious negotiations in the last quarter of 2024. However, a negotiated peace deal would not likely result in immediate cessation of fighting. Instability along ethnic and intercommunal lines, particularly in Darfur, is likely to continue. And pressure from civil society for elections and a transition to civil government is likely to increase. A push that is likely to be deeply resisted by any surviving military leadership, even if lip service is paid to it. In South Sudan, Political tensions and direct conflict between SPLA in government and SPLA in opposition will likely continue, remain dampened through the outlook period. However, the slow implementation of the 2018 peace deal and the nature of decentralized command structure of the armed forces continues to limit the ability to provide security nationwide, manifesting in power, uh, political power struggles at the state level and continued risk of sporadic clashes in the unity, Upper Nile, and Jongle states. Localized and sporadic intercommunal fighting is expected to continue through 2023, likely exacerbated by the return of thousands of South Sudanese refugees who are residing in Sudan. These anticipated conflict incidences are likely to result in additional displacement and disruption of trade and markets, as well as of the delivery of human humanitarian assistance. As preparations for elections in December 2024 continue, FuseNet will continue to monitor the evolving election process and any possible impacts it has on household food security. The June to September rainy season is expected to be cumulatively average to above average across Sudan and average to below average in South Sudan with below average expected across much of the eastern half of the country. In terms of flooding for South Sudan, while river basin levels were high at the start of the season and flood extents remain comparable to 2022, roughly, the overall flood extent is expected to remain lower, in the pa uh, lower than the past two years based on NOAA, USGS, and Nassau streamflow and rainfall forecasting. Importantly, other factors that have been associated with catastrophic flooding in the past four years include include early start to the rainy season, higher intensity of rainfall during the season, particularly in peak months of August and September, and a late end to the season, plus above average rainfall upstream in Uganda, have not and are not likely to emerge this season. The, in terms of crop production, the 2023 harvest in Sudan is expected to be below average, though variation are expected between areas. 
In general, the conflict is expected to reduce cultivation by reducing households' access to agricultural finance inputs and labor, as well as their physical access to fields in areas of heavy fighting. Planting and production in semi-mechanized and irrigated sectors will most likely be significantly affected by delayed and reduced access to agricultural finance and inputs, compounding on challenges faced last year. These challenges will likely lead to a, sh a shift towards increased production under traditional rain-fed cultivation and consequently lower yields. The 2023 harvest in South Sudan is expected to be similar or slightly below last year and the long-term average, though variation are anticipated at state and county levels. The relative calm in many, er in many regions combined with the arrival of South Sudanese returnees from Uganda and DRC in the equatorial region have contributed to increased planting. However, localized seasonal rainfall deficits, particularly in parts of central and eastern Equatoria, and farmer herder conflict is expected to interfere with crop production. In some localized areas of Jungle and parts of Upper Nile, sporadic attacks and violence will persist and interfere with planting and harvest. And many of the newly arrived South Sudanese returnees from Sudan will lack access to land and seas to participate in crop production in 2023. In Sudan, the disruption of the banking system will continue to disrupt any progress on implementation of exchange rate reform intended to lower the inflation rate. Additionally, continued fighting in urban areas, particularly Khartoum, and along primary tra trade routes will significantly curtail business operations, interrupt salary payments, reduce consumer activities, and cause the economy to further contract. Reduced income opportunities, limited cash availability, and insecurity affecting access will likely continue to reduce market demand. Staple grain prices are expected to escalate above already extremely high levels, 200 to 700% above the five-year average and 100 to 200% above last year, and remain high during the post-harvest period when they would otherwise typically decline. In South Sudan, growth is expected to be limited by periodic disruptions to ongoing peace deal implementation and continued in insecurity, global financial market volatility, and weather uh, challenges. The exchange rate is expected to continue to depreciate from uh, 950 to 985 South Sudanese pounds to the dollar to about 900 pounds to the dollar and drive further increases in food and non-food prices and reduce household purchasing power amid limited labor opportunities and stagnant wages. Food prices are expected to rise seasonally through August before declining slightly with the arrival of expected harvests. However, prices are expected to remain high at 80 to 185 percent above last year on the five-year average, even in the post-harvest period due to regionally high prices and will remain particularly high in the northern markets given expected reduction in trade from Sudan. So bringing it all together, we'll turn to the projected outcomes from uh, having June to September on the left and um, October to January on the right with peak needs estimates in the center. In Sudan, the June to September period will be by widespread crisis and emergency, particularly in urban centers of Greater Darfur, Greater Kordofan, Blue Nile, and Khartoum. While area level emergency was not assessed in Khartoum, it's expected that an atypically high proportion of populations will be in crisis and emergency given the disruption to income sources, markets, and trade flows. In West Darfur, widespread emergency outcomes are expected with pockets of households in, uh, expected to be in catastrophe, IPC phase five. Overall, the pan of 11 to 12 million people at the peak of the lean season represents the highest estimate by FuseNet for Sudan, with one in four people estimated to be in need. And this is an increase of 50% over pre-conflict projections for this lean period. South Sudan will remain one of the high, uh, most food insecure countries with over 60% of the population expected to be acutely food insecure during the lean season, largely due to underlying and protracted impacts of multiple years of flooding, ongoing conflict, persistently poor macroeconomic conditions and high and rising food and non-food prices. Crisis and emergency will be widespread across much of the country, except in Western Bar Ghazal due to the arrival of the first season harvest. Based on WFP's updated food assistance plan this period, WFP aims to reach the nearly 2.9 million people, uh, which FuseNet assesses will meet at least 25% of the daily kilocalorie needs for 25% of the population, resulting in the placement of an exclamation uh, mark in some counties. However, in northern counties, given the erosion of livelihoods over the years and anticipated impact of below average rainfall on crop production, 
and pressure on scarce resources posed by the arrival of South Sudanese returnees from Sudan, these areas will remain of con high concern. Um, in the second projection period, the arrival of harvest is expected to improve outcomes slightly across the region, but many areas will remain in crisis with some still in emergency in both countries. In Sudan, the harvest is expected to be below average overall due, to particu due particularly to the direct and indirect impacts of the conflict. In the southeastern parts of the country, where a large share of agricultural production occurs under semi-mechanized and irrigated sectors, Households' access to food is expected to improve slightly in the post-harvest period, even though production is expected to be below average. In Greater Darfur, the intensification of conflict is expected to keep much of the area in crisis, with some areas in emergency, particularly in West Darfur and Central Darfur, given the expectation of significantly below average cultivation and severe disruption to livelihoods and income sources. In Khartoum, with conflict intensity expected to reduce towards the end of the year, Market, market flows are expected to improve along with access to income opportunities and to markets, thus contributing to a reduction in severity of outcomes. However, crisis will, is expected to persist at area level in Khartoum. In South Sudan, during this main harvest period, some improvements are expected with a reduction of emergency outcomes in Warap, lakes, parts of Equatoria, and parts of Jongle, although crisis is expected to be the dominant outcome across much of the unimodal parts of the country, given the protracted issues mentioned earlier. With improvement to stressed outcomes in bimodal parts of Western Equatoria, where production is expected to be average. Emergency will persist in Fashoda, Panyukang, and Rank of Upper Nile, Fangak, and Canal PG of Jungle, and a whale north and a whale east of northern Bar Ghazal. Due to the protracted negative impacts of conflict, expectation for below to significantly below average harvest and the large scale influx of South Sudanese returnees. So turning now to a few brief slides on the areas of concern. We'll start in Sudan with El Janina in West Darfur. West Darfur has experienced the most severe violence and targeted ethnic killings concentrated mostly in El Janina, reflected in the dark blue bars on the graph on the left, although it has spread to additional localities in West Darfur. The most severe episodes of violence and killing in El Janina was reported in mid-June with investigations into the extent of mass killings. And the violence has led to significant displacement both internally and across the border to Chad. Given the scale of violence and resulting disruption to household access to food and income sources during what is typically the lean season, FuseNet anticipates that the area will remain in emergency IPC phase four with some households expected to be in catastrophe IPC phase five in the lean season. This is based on a convergence of evidence between household economy analysis, outcome analysis exercise for rural populations that was conducted in June for the October 2022 to September 2023 consumption year, plus insight from the REACH assessments in late June, suggesting increased use of emergency coping strategies, including consumption of seeds and severe restrictions on mobility, and also key informant information, albeit limited due to continued communications blackouts. For the outcome analysis, results of which are shown on the right, the exercise aims to assess the size of household consumption deficits upon most likely changes to typical food and income sources in the context of a shock, in this case, conflict. So if we look at the chart on the right, the y-axis represents food and income as a percentage of minimum annual requirements. Or in other words, food and income sources are converted to kilocalories, which are then compared to a 2,100 kilocalorie per person per day requirement. The column in the middle represents what a very poor household was able to meet through their typical food and income sources in the current year with the, with the impact of the shock compared to the reference year on uh, the bar on the left and the survival and livelihood projection thresholds on the right. For, these, for the thresholds, if total food and income falls below the light blue reference bar, households are likely to have a livelihoods protection deficit and may be engaged in negative livelihoods coping strategies to mitigate food consumption gaps. If total food and income falls below the top of the pink reference bar, then the household is likely to have food consumption gaps indicative of a survival deficit. In the reference year, very poor households in rain-fed uh, sorghum belt of El Janina typically have access to food and income sources over the course of the year that exceed the minimum by over 40%, meaning they had sufficient food and income to not only cover their basic needs, but also invest in livelihood activities. The main driver of decline in the current year is the reduction in income from agricultural labor, given the assumption of declines in cultivation due to conflict. 
and an income from self-employment, which is self sale of um, firewood, charcoal, and grass due to conflict-related restrictions on household mobility and disruption to local markets. However, looking at it as an annual present um, doesn't illustrate the changes expected seasonally. So for example, the large green bar at the bottom of the chart represents household food stocks from own production, labeled as crops, which was depleted or near depleted by the start of the conflict in April going into the lean season. Thus in the lean season months, the deficit is expected to have increased to about 45% of minimum food energy needs indicative of emergency IPC phase four. Furthermore, when considering peri-urban populations in El Janina that have been most severely affected by violence, the conflict is expected to have an even greater impact on household mobility given fear of attacks. So taking all of these in combination in the analysis, as mentioned earlier, FuseNet assesses that there were likely households facing catastrophe IPC phase five in El Janina and surrounding towns. Turning to South Sudan, um, I'll present a, a few slides on the risk of famine in Upper Nile Jongle border area. And first I'll start with a quick uh, review of FuseNet's protocol for assessing risk of famine. In the process of scenario development, FuseNet identifies credible events that have a moderate likelihood of occurrence and as such could change the most likely scenario. If the outcome of the credible alternative scenario is famine, IPC phase five, then the assumptions are developed uh, to detail how food security conditions will change in the projection period under this credible alternative scenario. And FuseNet will communicate that the country faces a risk of famine. FuseNet continues to assess that a credible risk of famine persists in the border area between Northern Jungle and Southern Upper Nile through the lean season, given the widespread loss of productive assets uh, following years of conflict and floods that continue to undermine the household's capacity to cope with shocks and rebuild livelihoods. However, analysis of recent trends and forecasts suggests a decline in these risk factors associated with the risk of famine, namely violent conflict and flooding. In the graph on the left, ACLA data documents a continued lull in conflict over the last six months, except for isolated incidents and tensions associated with overcrowding and tension over uh, scarce resources. Flooding risk is also assessed as likely to have declined and or as, as likely to be less than in the last two years, given below average rainfall and steam stream flow forecasts and the absence of key factors necessary for emergence of catastrophic flooding, as detailed earlier in the assumptions part of the presentation. Um, turning to the, uh, that's in our most likely scenario, we expect that while sporadic clashes are expected to continue, um, the, due to reasons explained earlier, um, underlying intercommunal and political, politicized tensions, influx of South Sudanese returnees, competition over scarce resources, Households that have returned to homesteads will continue to engage in crop and livestock production, albeit limited due to loss of assets, low access to inputs, and, a, and slow recovery of livestock herd sizes. Uh, in addition, flood waters are not expected to exceed typical extents, thus allowing for improved mobility and access to humanitarian assistance and wild foods. Uh, however, due to already high levels of poor food consumption, negative coping, and high acute malnutrition, emergency outcomes are still expected to persist with pockets of households in catastrophe through the lean season, particularly in Panyakang and Fashoda. In our credible alternative scenario, FuseNet assessed that famine IPC phase five could occur if the following conditions emerge. There is large scale deterioration in conflict between armed groups. This occurs alongside extensive flooding during the rainy season and that these events isolate households from accessing food income and humanitarian aid for a prolonged period. As always, FuseNet will continue to monitor and assess the risk of famine in South Sudan. And with that, I'll end the briefing. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this point.